Hello, everybody. This is Stuart Wilde of StuartWilde.com. I'm talking today with Mike Adams. Um, he's known as the Health Ranger, and he has a wonderful site called NaturalNews.com. And um, I go to it most days. It has wonderful stories about natural remedies and um, things that you can do to heal yourself physically and emotionally and so forth. And um, he's come on today to talk about DMT. And uh, that's one of my favorite subjects because, as you all know, I've been a great promoter of um, ayahuasca, and that is one of the main components of the ayahuasca uh, brew. Anyway, welcome, Mike, and uh, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you, Stuart. It's great to be with you today, and uh, I'm really interested to talk with you about this subject and uh, consciousness and, and, and all that. So wherever you want to start is okay with me. Well, why did you start... Uh, by describing to the listeners what is DMT, because um, I don't know if necessarily many people have really heard of it and so forth. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I don't claim to be an expert on DMT. Uh, I've never used it, never even tried it, uh, but I've written about it, and I Brother, believe there's a conspiracy. You need to, to come over to Europe it. and hang out with us. You need to come and <laughs> hang out with us. <laughs> In Holland, That's or, what I hear. yeah, yeah, you've got to come because it really is the 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 doorway to another evolution, in my view. It's the um, it's the active uh, um, compound in ayahuasca, and uh, of course, it's dimethyl tryptamine. So, yeah. um, it is sort of showing the way to humanity now to for like an evolution beyond the insanity that surrounds us. Yes, yes. Well, let me just jump right into it and, and say that even though I haven't experienced it, uh, and, but maybe I will in the future, who knows, but I do believe that you know we are, we are free will, conscious spirits living in, in, in a human body and a human experience, and that there are gateways between our physical existence and our spiritual uh, wisdom or knowledge, which is much, much greater. And that it appears to be that a lot of those gateways are controlled or governed through the, the pituitary system or in the energetic world, you might call it the chakras of, of, of the energetic body, the bioenergy body. And DMT seems to be a key that unlocks uh, some of those doorways and allows us, our, our, our souls, to experience a much more grand reality. Now, you're more of an expert on that than I am, but that's at least my understanding of it as a nutritionist and an investigative journalist. Well, I couldn't have put it better myself, to tell you the truth. It definitely opens a doorway. You know, the human body has DMT in it naturally. So some people like to pretend it's a drug, but it's not. You know, it's, uh, right. it's a natural right. substance inside the physical body. Now, the body fires DMT at birth, and I believe that's so because it's very stressful for that small child to come down the birth canal, and the DMT keeps it calm and aware of what's going mm -hmm. on. And then they say that the body fires DMT at death, and that's the near-death tube and the visions of celestial beings, or whatever that people see when they're approaching death. And then in between, there isn't much happening for most people because they're very DMT depleted. And you would know more about the nutrition of DMT than I do, but a lot of it's to do with junk food and stress and alcohol and so forth. Um, but um, yes. we use uh, DMT in the ayahuasca ceremonies um, as a way of sort of filling people's supply back up. And... It also explains why sometimes when a person has an ayahuasca journey, the first journey they have, they just go into a bliss state and they can feel what they what is known in South America as the medicine, la medicina, which is going around their body, but they don't see visions. And then on the second journey, they see visions. So it's almost like the glass has to be filled up first before they can see. But I mean, it's known as the spirit molecule because of its visionary gift to right. humanity. And I think the, the bigger, I, I agree with everything you just said, by the way, but I think the, the real story here is that globally, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I believe there is a global effort to suppress consciousness. 
And that effort takes many forms. Uh, some of it is chemical, such as in the fluoride that's put into the water supply. Uh, some of it is is uh, energetic or informational, such as the, the suppression of knowledge that's done by government regulators to try to make entire civilizations forget about their ethno-botanical history, uh, the wisdom of the plants. You know, the FDA's role in the United States is to obliterate all indigenous knowledge of plant medicine. There, there are many other examples of this, but governments do not want people to attain consciousness. And this is the main reason behind the war on drugs. The war on drugs doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make sense from a justice point of view or a judicial point of view. It only makes sense if you realize the government wants to keep people suppressed and unaware and spiritually devolved or even thinking that they don't have a spirit. So that's that's why DMT might be the key to unlocking a revolution of spiritual freedom for the future of humanity. That's the big story. Well, I think that's right. And I think that there has been this suppression because obviously the more people that take, let's say, DMT or mushrooms or that smoke pot, the more they get out of the matrix, they get out of TikTok. Now, mushrooms were legal in Britain just up until a couple of three years ago. And I mean, really? you could just walk into any shop and buy them, but they banned them and then they banned them in Holland. And there were a few right. horror stories of teenagers getting stoned and jumping off bridges into the canal and that sort of stuff. But <laughs> there wasn't really any reason to ban them. But yeah, there is this global dumbing down of society. And then I've noticed also the, the censorship that goes on. I mean, you're not really free to write what you want to write anymore on the Internet no. without being sort of stomped upon. And certainly all the big sites, you know, YouTube, Google, Facebook, they all exercise a, a policy of censorship. And a lot Absolutely. of it, yeah, a lot of it's political, like Facebook censor anybody that that is pro the Second Amendment and, and the right to bear arms and you know, that's a political stance of Facebook's, I suppose. But, I mean, like, surely people should be able to discuss things, but that's not so anymore. <laughs> well, that's it's just like so. what we talked about, where it said the FDA wants to suppress and eliminate knowledge of ethnobotanical history. Facebook wants to destroy and eliminate discussion of ideas of, of liberty, things that it does not want you to talk about. Our account got banned for posting a photo of Gandhi and a quote from Gandhi. I remember reading the quote. I remember reading the quote. It was something about the British taking away the guns from the Indian people, wasn't it? Y yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's an innocuous was, quote, it was, isn't it? Well, and it was just a piece of history. And so, you know, history, I mean, this is classic, you know, Orwellian 1984 stuff where yeah. uh, Winston has to rewrite the history books to conform to the current desires of the government. Yeah. So on Facebook, you're not allowed to discuss the history that is true. You have to selectively post only the history that is congruent with Facebook's current political agenda. Yes. And that's not freedom, man. No, and did you get your site reinstated at Facebook or was it banned forever? We, we got it reinstated with a warning that if we ever posted anything that they didn't like and they didn't give us any guidelines on that, that so, we would be permanently banned. So how are you? You're viewing four kids being mentally abused by their parents. What's They've been that? forced to continuously eat a new product. That's on your side. Or Velbites. Right, by their grandparents. Sorry. Emo. Right. I'm sorry. Okay, let's just, let's just rerun it and I'll edit the tape. So um, I'll ask you again. Um, was your site reinstated um, by Facebook? Yes, it was. But only after we were warned that if we posted anything that Facebook didn't like in the future, we would be permanently banned and just shut down. So, and, and Facebook didn't tell us what guidelines would qualify for that. So it, it's like being in an informational minefield. Uh, how am I supposed to know? Maybe if I post something about DMT on Facebook, they will say, oh, that's, that's an illegal criminal drug, and now you're banned. You know, <laughs> it, it's like if you post... A mathematical equation, E equals MC squared. Oh, no, that's, that's not accepted anymore. You're banned, you know? Yeah. It's, it's absurd. It is very sort of scary because there must be a lot of journalists that are inhibited. Um, I noticed the other day an article that the journalist John Rappaport, who's been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, so he's an eminent writer, 
was banned from Facebook for writing an article that was critical of Obama. Well, yes. I mean, a lot of Americans voted for Obama and most didn't, you know. I don't know. Right. I mean, the fact that somebody doesn't agree with Obama's um, executive orders and the police state and all these sort of various sort of fascist things that he's instigated, I mean, it's fair political comment, but this poor bloke's been banned. And how would he know that, that that would offend Facebook? I mean, how would he know that? Well, well, right. And and John Rappaport, you know, I consider him a colleague. He's a, he and I talk frequently. He's a, he is a brilliant researcher yeah. and writer. Um, he's, he is really what I would call an old school journalist, the way journalism used to actually investigate reality and, and report on scandals and blow the whistle. That's what, uh, Journalism is supposed to be, but that's not tolerated in America anymore. Yes. You have to simply conform. So we've become a, a culture, and I think this is happening globally as well, where conformity is what gets you a voice now, but if you don't conform to the status quo, you are censored, you are marginalized, you are demonized, and you're even labeled in, in America, you could be labeled a terrorist, for supporting the Constitution upon which the nation was founded. Yes, it's very strange and it's very frightening for people, I think. I mean, I hope that some force comes along and sort of washes all this ugliness away. But I used to know of people that did ayahuasca journeys in America, sort of obviously on the quiet, but I know yeah. that they've stopped now and some of them have moved to other places. Um, we, do, yeah. we do ayahuasca ceremonies in... Uh, in uh, in Holland, where it's legal, and in um, Ecuador, and our site is uh, thehiddendoorway.com, and um, they're very safe because they're sort of not run by like shonky shamans. You know, these are sort of very <laughs> upstanding. Well, some of the shamans are, are very dodgy, and then there are other shamans sure. that are, are absolutely wise old men. They're beautiful, and and they bring a great thing to ayahuasca but then there's the ones that sort of want to rip off the gringos that are out there as well but um, our people are British and um, you know they're sort of terribly upstanding so that's how we offer the ayahuasca ceremonies in safe environments where it is legal and I think it's semi-legal in Portugal because Portugal got rid of almost all of their drug laws um, it's quite an extraordinary piece of legislation but um, and yes. of course drug crime in Portugal is Portugal has completely collapsed. There is no drug crime there anymore because everything there is right. legal. And so um, it's made a huge difference. No, I it's think a it's a brilliant solution. Well, it is a solution because, you know, if they sort of made, I mean, if there were sort of hash shops, pot shops that you could go to and maybe even pay a government tax to get an ounce or whatever and other, you know, fairly benign drugs, then then you wouldn't need all the violence and the guns and all that stuff, would you, you know? It... Well, that's it. Once you, you know, prohibition doesn't work socially, economically, um, it, it, just in terms of laws. It doesn't work, no matter what you're trying to prohibit. You know, we had that terrible experiment in America in the 1920s with uh, alcohol prohibition. Uh, it didn't work. It failed. And what, But what it did do was it funneled millions of dollars, which at that time was like billions, into the underground criminal economy. It created a criminal economy yes. and it created a, a, a brutal police state <clears throat> government whose job was to run around throwing people in prison who were just trying to have a beer, you know. So whether you prohibit DMT or marijuana or uh, alcohol, it, it always has the same economic effect, which is this huge underground economy, massive criminality, violence, you name it, is, is what is spawned from that policy. So prohibition doesn't work ever throughout throughout world history. It hasn't worked. It doesn't no, work. No. I noticed reading on your site, naturalnews.com, there's lots and lots of stories of alternative red remedies for cancer and and stories about pesticides and Parkinson's disease, I think I read this morning. And there's a sort of movement now to sort of get rid of vitamins, to get rid of alternative therapies, to sort of make all those people seem like they're sort of witch doctors and, and defrauding people. But of course, we all know, say, for example, that chemotherapy 
makes people really sick. It actually makes the cancer worse. So if you have got cancer, chemo chemotherapy may not be the way to go. You know, there might be other ways, you know. Sure, yeah. Well, it's interesting. There's been about a 100-year medical monopoly in, in the Western world. And the, this, you know, look, all, all industries in the world throughout human history want to become monopolies. The petroleum industry wants to dominate energy. Yeah. You know, the software industry wants to dominate your software. Um, medical industry wants to dominate medicine and push out all competing alternatives. They, they don't want a free market. They don't want competition. And the purpose of government regulators is to enforce the monopolies. So the FDA enforces a monopoly. The patent office enforces intellectual property monopolies over molecules. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because wow. molecules like DMT, for example, are generated, you know, in nature, in your own body. Yeah, of course. But, and, and the genetic code of the human body, you would think, is your property, right? But according to the U.S. Patent Office, about 20% of the genes in the human genome are owned by patent holders, which are mostly corporations and universities. Right. So technically, when you reproduce and have children, you stand in violation of thousands of different patents, and you owe royalties to those patent owners because you have replicated their intellectual property according to the U.S. Patent Office. Wow. And drug companies, of course, commit mass biopiracy. They go out into nature. In fact, they've done this in Ecuador. They've sent teams to go out there with the Schwar shamans in Ecuador to find all their best medicine, come back and replicate those molecules, slightly alter them, patent them, get a drug approved based on it, and then eliminate all the, the plants that have that similar molecule by claiming those plants have been contaminated with a drug. <laughs> that's ridiculous, isn't it? But then again, this is goes back do. this is go back to what this goes back to what you said at the very beginning of this interview when you said that like they want to um, dominate knowledge. They don't want people to be free and they don't want people to see um, the reality. I mean, there's that wonderful line at the end of The Matrix when Neo flies up out of the telephone box and he says, I don't know how this ends, but I'm going to show you a world without them, you know? And I think that's the yeah. sort of brave new world that I write about in, on my site, about the, the dawn of the celestial light, which is going to show us a world without these predators, without these people, without these insidious controllers that are sort right. of crippling people because we're not allowed to breathe. <laughs> well, you got to realize that humanity has, is being kept down. It's yeah. being suppressed spiritually, physically, economically, at every yeah. level by the uh, very small number of global controllers. Yeah. And they, they use suppression as a way to funnel power and money into their own hands. So they are actually compromising the entire evolution of humanity in order to have their own profit. And this is, again, comes back to the war on drugs and DMT, where, you know, DMT should be researched even more as a, a that key that unlocks awareness, that allows people to realize there is a connection between all living things, for example. Yes, it does imagine, that. It does that, definitely. Yeah. And one other Imagine thing that the it does, would have if people felt sorry. like they, they were connected to others instead of isolated. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely, because once you take DMT, you can see a connection to plants, the animals, the moon, the sun, the dawn, the people, they're all one. We're not separated yes. as different nations or different uh, ethnic origins or whatever. But one of the things about DMT, which I found extraordinary, is that it cures depression more or less instantly. And I've had people That's come it. to the ayahuasca that have been, let's say, with their therapist and on various Prozacs and stuff like that. And uh, they're cured in one drink because it changes the serotonin levels in the brain and it changes the way the brain uptakes and so forth. And like, I mean, we've had instant cures and it's not one or two. It's like, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I've been to the ayahuasca with about 5,000 people, you know, and generally speaking, a group. You know, it might be 60 people, 40 people. And then sometimes people came to the ayahuasca and I didn't attend, but I was like the force behind organizing it. 
And um, I mean, there's, yeah. th- there's hundreds. I don't even know. There might even be a thousand people that have drunk one glass of ayahuasca, having been depressed for 10 years, and they're cured. So, yes. you know, I mean, ayahuasca <laughs> should be something that you'll be able to go down. A sh- I mean, the DMT, you ought to be able to do something you could get in the health food shop. When you're feeling a bit right. low, you know, like 5-HTP, let's say, you can still buy that in Europe. But um, Well, and the, the, the government regulators, their, their angle on this is, well, one person might be harmed. You know, one person might overdo it. And therefore, we have to be your daddy and your mommy and tell you what you can buy and what you can't buy and what you can drink. Well, but they conveniently ignore that every year, just in America alone... 783,000 people are killed by medicine, killed by pharmaceuticals, killed by surgeries, killed by superbug infections in the hospitals. That number alone is 48,000 annually. This is annually. So, you're looking at 700-something thousand annually, are you, Mike? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 783,000 yeah. per wow. year killed yeah. by conventional medicine. Not on purpose, obviously. They're not being murdered, but they're being killed by conventional medicine. So this idea that, oh, we got to ban uh, DMT because, you know, five people might might overdose on it. Meanwhile, you, you're, you know, a thousand times more likely to get killed by a superbug infection down at the local clinic. You know, it just doesn't make sense. It, it's hypocrisy. Well, the fact is that, like, um, you know, ayahuasca has been going for 100,000 years. And um, there aren't really any reports of anybody dying from taking ayahuasca. Right. And then there was a story that I read some months ago about a kid. He was a teenager, and the shaman gave him a bottle of ayahuasca to look after. And the kid decided to drink the whole bottle. And <laughs> Yeah, but that was like, you know, taking, I don't know, it'd be like, let's say, drinking 25 bottles of whiskey or something, you know. And uh, right. he did meet a sorry end, but I don't think anybody within a controlled ceremony with a proper shaman has ever died on ayahuasca because DMT is natural. It's not like... On mushrooms, people can space out and drop off a bridge, you know, or jump over. Yeah. But um, it's... Uh, well, well, right. So... But they don't want people experimenting. That's the thing. You see, in society today, it's, it's all about conformity. Look at public schools. It, 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 when, you, when you're a child, at least in America, this is the way it works, you go to public school, they don't tell you, oh, be creative, be innovative, be independent. Be, no. uh, explore on your own, discover the world, uh, you know, express your greatest, your greatest self. No, the message is stand in line, don't talk, raise your hand, obey, 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 conform, obedience, obedience. You're not allowed to have thoughts outside the box. Yeah. You're not allowed to explore outside the box. Here's your history. Here's yeah. the allowable science that you're supposed to learn and repeat. Here's the allowable uh, 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 words and phrases that you can use in English class. I mean, George Carlin, who was a brilliant comedian, yes. was very right about this when he said, all they want to do is create obedient workers. That's the goal. And DMT wakes people up, at least this is my understanding, it wakes people up and it causes them to challenge the obedience grid and look outside the matrix. Well, I mean, you're 100% right because... I mean, normally people can't see visions, but once you take DMT, and once the pineal is sort of stocked up on it again, so to speak, um, you start to see visions, and those visions are visions of the inner worlds, dimensions, it could be family relationships, money, abundance. It's many different things, but you can begin to see, and the difference between a person that can see and the ones that can't see um, is chalk and cheese. I mean... A lot of people see yeah. through their dreams and through their intuition, and that's good enough. But the DMT molecule definitely takes you up to the next level. And, of course, what I suppose the governments and so forth don't want is people to see what an ugly sham they are. <laughs> I think that's very true. And I also think it's a real danger to the, the systems of power on our world if people realize that they are more than their physical bodies. If people yeah. realize there's a spiritual being that does not die at physical death, yeah. then all of a sudden that changes the equation. It's like, oh my God, maybe I shouldn't just be a, a, a CEO that screws everybody for the, to collect the most money. You know, maybe I shouldn't you know, be a bad person that, that just 
exercises dictatorial power over everyone else. If you believe that there is something after life, then you must eventually believe that you are held accountable for your actions at some in some way, whether you believe in the biblical gates of heaven thing or you believe in a spiritual karma. There is judgment. There is karma, in, in effect, for your actions here. It's, a, it's an inescapable conclusion once you realize that you live beyond this life. Yeah, there's no question about that. I mean, in the, um, in the Aya worlds and even outside the Aya worlds, I, I was able to see the hell worlds and even fight in there by firing a purple dot from my fingers. And I know that really? sounds, yeah, I know that sounds really extreme, but I, it lasted for about a thousand days, the purple dot. And, um, I've spent about 4,500 hours in total watching hell. I consider myself like a bit of a world expert. When you, if you want to know about hell, just ask me a question. And, well, I'm um, very curious to ask you about this, actually. Well, yeah. those dimensions are very, very real, and they're very tormenting, and they're sort of winged entities with claws, and there's imps, and there's little black beings that run around, and there's... Like there's a lot of different beings in, in the hell worlds, many, many. I don't know if there's trillions of different species, but certainly there's several hundred that I've seen. And those worlds are very real. Yes, so are the heavens, of course. Well, the hells are real and so are the heavens. The celestial heavens are also very real as well. They're both real. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really wanting to ask you, um, to what extent is this dimension of hell able to reach into our three-dimensional earth dimension and influence people or even take over people because I'm, it seems like that is the only explanation for what is happening behind certain people. It, 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 is, that, is that true in your experience or what do you know about that? No, you're 100% right. The hell worlds aren't very far away. They exist in a mirror world and if you outstretch your arm in front of you, the dimension of heavens and hells starts halfway between your elbow and your wrist. So then if you bring your hand in front of you and sort of guess the distance, it's about 18 inches from your nose. And those beings can definitely talk to humans, they can influence them, they can demonically possess them. And um, I do a certain amount of hands-on healing and stuff like that. I usually do it out in the street or sometimes it's at a health food shop or something like that. And uh, I've worked on 92 demonic possession cases this year alone, you know. So it's, wow. It, wow. yeah, it's where people have become so infiltrated by these demonic beings that they sort do, of lose do control. Those people... oh, carry I'm sorry, on. I don't mean to interrupt. There's a little bit of a delay. Yeah, no, carry on, Mike. Um, Please carry on talking. Do those people, how do they get possessed? Do they invite the evil in or do they uh, allow it without intention? Or how do, how do they get possessed? Sometimes they call it in because they want to bring in, bring those beings in for power and uh, spells and, you know, sexual tricks or whatever, you know. Sometimes yeah. it comes from extremes of like an internal spiritual fascism, you know, where they're very controlling and very nasty and very sort of oppressive towards other humans. So... It's not just normal antagonism, let's say, hey, you don't like these people or you don't like those people. This is sort of serious forms of hatred. And then a lot of times it comes from um, sexual practices, but not normal sexual healthy practices, but obscure or obtuse or degraded uh, sexual... Like pedophilia or things like that? Yeah, pedophilia or extremes of porno where they start to go mentally imbalanced, you know? Uh, where they start to go nutty. Um, so it's, it's a number of different things. It's a, it's a number of different tricks. The inner world beings play on people's specialness. So they start to communicate to a person and they start telling them how special they are and how they've been chosen to bring a message to humanity or they've been chosen for some special role or whatever. And so that's how they usually trick them into it. And then sometimes wow. people just walk into a, like a portal. And there are like demonic portals on earth. They're like vortexes, of, you know, which are gateways to the devil worlds. And the person walks in there. I mean, they, they, they can't, obviously, if they're completely spiritual and sweet and kind, it isn't going to affect them. But it comes in of people's darkness. And then when these wow. beings start to accumulate in a person's mind or in their body, 
then they can start to lead them towards hellish ideas, suicide, say, for example, or, um, or depravity of one kind or another. So it's very common. Um, demonic possession is going to become a global disease. Because is, the, well, that's what I'm wondering. Are we, are we living in a in a massive global spiritual warfare right now, where forces of evil are literally trying to destroy humanity? That is a very good way of describing it. Yes, it's a spiritual warfare, and the forces of evil are trying to control people's souls, and the forces of good are shining this golden light at people and hoping that they come towards that. You know, and sometimes people get fed up of evil and they go to the light. Often, in fact, you know. Yeah. Well, what about what about after this life? Is, is there for those who have really engaged in a lot of destruction and evil and deception? Do 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 they do they literally experience a, a timeless purgatory hell type of uh, uh, existence? Then I don't know if it's timeless, but they definitely um, experience yes a purgatory hell. But then their higher self can incarnate back on this earth plane, even though they may still be in hell. So the, the the higher self has various incarnations in it. So there are people on earth that have like a higher self that last time they were on earth uh, was, was a mass murderer, you know. So that's how yeah. evil is propagated because there's nothing stopping the higher self reincarnating again into the earth plane, even though that individual person may be stuck. Because the times are so vast... It's impossible to say that they're there forever or not. We're not old enough, and we never will be, to figure it out ourselves. Do you follow me? Yeah, but from what I've read in, in uh, near-death experiences, um, that the dimension of time is gone in, yeah. in hell. So it's, it's like they've been there an instant, but also an eternity. Well, it's, um, yeah, it's that, a perpetual now. Yeah, you get that feeling of it being a perpetual now. But how long it is in relation to, let's say, Earth years, we can't tell. That's interesting. A perpetual now, right? Yeah. That's 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 consistent with what I've read. Yeah, it's that's what it is a day. It's a perpetual perpetual now. There's no sense of time. But then a lot of those dimensions don't have horizons either. So they're very confusing because you don't know if you're upside down or inside out or left or right. You can't you can't discriminate because there's no flat line to look at. You know, and even if uh -huh. you're sitting in a room, there's a flat line on the other wall that shows you that you're up straight. But some of those dimensions, there's no up straight. You cannot tell if you're upside down or straight or left or right or upside down or inside out. You can't tell. It's very, it's very confusing. So, how, how is it that you were able to uh, witness this, this hell? I mean, uh, you know, what, what was that? Were you an observer flying through or, or experiencing it yourself momentarily? Or what, how did that? Work? I saw it first on ayahuasca. And I saw these uh, cactus thorns on my hands. I held my hands up and I saw the cactus thorns. And I asked, what are they for? And I heard point and shoot. And so I'd see a ghoul in the distance and I would just breathe like a short, sharp breath at it. I would expel a breath and I would see this, this yellow dot go out and hit it. And then after that, I found that I could just see it in trance because by then I was used to it. So I'd sit on my bed and I'd fight. Am I four to six, sometimes eight hours a day, just down there watching them. And when I saw them, I'd fire, the, fire at them. But they were attractive. Wait, what, what were you seeing? What? Well, you see these demonic beings in there. They're digital fractal beings. Um, when uh. the humans get inside the hell world, the first thing that they do is they lose their arms and legs. And so they lose mobility. And so a lot of the beings in the hell worlds are just an upper body with a head. And they move, oh but, but they move very slowly, very, very slowly. And so you'd see them coming, and they come in on curved trajectories. And I've got a feeling that's something to do with gravity and the curvature of the earth, but I'm not sure. And you just, I was just sitting there, and I'd be knocking them down, like uh, firing at, uh, at, you know, sort of, I don't know, troops that are, that are attacking you across <laughs> no man's land. But um, And I'd be doing that six to eight hours a day. But those inner worlds, they are so disgusting and so horrible that I must say I would never um, want to do anything to deserve, you know, having to actually go there and stay there. Oh, yeah. They're but, beyond, beyond so you terrifying. you say six to eight hours a day, but why didn't you leave? I mean, why, why would... Well, I felt it was you... my duty after I saw the, the blue light leaving my hands that I felt it was my duty to go down there and destroy as many of them as possible, you know, and so that's what I did for three and a half years.
Wow, sort of like a spiritual warrior, like literally. Yeah, there was a number of us because I trained a couple, three, four, five other people to do it as well. So we would all go, sometimes we'd all go into trance together, you know, um, or we'd be in different parts of the world in trance at different times of the day. But it isn't really that hard to see. It's, it's not like it's hidden from us. It's there. And uh, we would just go in there and, and create as much havoc as we could with as many of them as we could, you know. And we don't know how many we killed because um, a lot of these ghouls, these devil beings, are inside other beings. So it's like those little Chinese dolls, you know, and every time you go in, there's another one underneath that's smaller. So a lot of the yeah. ghoul beings are like three and four. You hit them and three jump out. But one thing I'll tell people is that if you see a very beautiful feminine eye in, in meditation or on ayahuasca, be very, very careful because the ghouls hide inside those feminine eyes. It's a bit as like saying that it's a spaceship. And when you hit the feminine eye, three ghouls jump out, but they hide in the feminine eye because it's, a, it's disarming and people look at the feminine eye and it's like, this program that says, wow, it's my mother, you know, here's my mother looking at me. But in fact, it's, it's a trick of the ghouls to move around in the female eye as a sort of morph image around themselves, you know? Fascinating. Um, yeah. You know, uh, David Icke talks a lot about uh, different vibrations and different yeah. dimensions. Um, so I suppose in this case, DMT simply allows you to sense a different vibratory reality. That coexists. With Definitely, there's no question of it. The you apparent. Know? Yeah, yeah. I remember bugging David to go to ayahuasca, and eventually he did go. And then he came back, and his teachings were different after that because he was <laughs> well. He was sort of saying things like "love is the answer," and he talked about this vibrational rate and stuff. So he definitely, uh, you know, found a use, a use in his travels. He went. I think he went to Peru, and uh, you know, he definitely got a benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah, that, well, I've, I've talked to many people. You know, I used to live in Ecuador, and, I, and I've spoken with many people who, who came to Ecuador to go on a, an ayahuasca uh, journey. Yes. Um, they, you know, I've, so I've spoken to many, many people. I just never did it myself. Oh. But um, it, well, you, you should know, come. It, you should come with us. You know, we do them at a resort that used to be the president's summer palace, and it's just near Tabacundo, which you probably know if you were lived in Ecuador. It's about an no, hour. That, that name doesn't ring a bell. It's about an hour out of Quito, northeast of Quito. Oh, okay, all right. No, I mean, yeah, northeast of Quito, yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful resort. It's uh, it's an extraordinary place, like a Garden of Eden with sort of llamas on the lawns and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's been uh, it's been a wonderful thing going to Ecuador over the years. Yeah, well, it sounds like it. Um, I'm just not sure that I'm that I want to go into. Uh, Purgatory hell and and, and no 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 but you have to understand that's not yeah that's not a normal ayahuasca journey it was just my karma oh. that took me you know that took me there do you follow me um, yeah it, I it was just my karma to go there and fight in those worlds it's not what um, um, it's it's not what uh, what normally happens in ayahuasca normally people see the heaven worlds and they get perceptions of their families and their body and their health and that sort of stuff it's not uh, it's not devilish necessarily. And then, of course, you have to see right. both sides of everything to become a complete, you know, to complete the knowledge that you seek. True, yeah. But what would you say to the skeptics who say, well, you know, this is all just imagined? And those are the same people, by the way, who say there is no consciousness, there is no free will, there is no afterlife. You're just like a, a, a skin bag uh, yeah. a biological robot, and when you die, you die, and that's it. Well, I think I would say to them, listen, bro, let's go down to the pub and have a few drinks, and let's not talk about this stuff, <laughs> because if they honestly <laughs> believe there is no consciousness, well, fine, let them believe whatever they want to believe, and um, let them say what they want to say, and let's just go have a drink and forget about it, because there's no question that the whole of the world is consciousness. I mean, a, a tree is a mathematical fractal code. It's a mathematical equation that describes the, you know, how wide the branches are and where they go and the leaves. I mean, there isn't anything in the world that isn't a mathematics. We're inside a mathematical uh, simulation or inside a, yeah. a mathematical formula. So, you know, I suppose, how do you convince somebody if they don't believe it? And the answer is don't bother, you know? 
Yeah, that's that's actually a very a very good answer because uh, you know they'll find out soon enough. <laughs> they'll find out soon enough, and it really doesn't matter what they believe. See, I'm a great believer in live and let live, and also I think it's totally important for people to believe whatever they want to believe, um, even if what they believe is ludicrous, because what they believe is part of their karma, and it will create their life, and maybe there's things they have to experience down the road that you just don't want to change necessarily. So they'll come when they want to, and they won't if they don't want to, and that's simple, really. Yeah, that's... I, I tend to agree with that, you know, live and let live. I have sort of a libertarian philosophy uh, along those lines. Yes. And, uh, but, of course, so much of the world that exists today is all based on controlling you. It's not live and let live. It's, it's you know, we, uh, the government, want to control, you know, what you think, what you eat, even even how you experience consciousness. <laughs> I say, so, I say in my book that um, control is demonic. Because it's like demonic yeah. possession, and that administration is different. Because the example I give is, if you own or if you run a, a railway company, administration is you know setting a tie table, you know hiring drivers, getting the railway. Right. You know that's different because the drivers can come to work or not as they wish. But uh, you know forcing control over people is is a demonic trait. It's part of how the hell worlds want to dominate us. So. We should try to stay away from control and allow everybody to be what they want to be, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, there are just so many systems of control that, that are resisting that. But think about where our world could be if we really allowed, if everyone had an allowing philosophy and it was more about how do we support others rather than dominating them, um, I mean, I'm sure you're well aware that most of the wars and terrorism and everything is all fabricated. You know, it's all yes. staged and engineered to create control. Um, if if those systems of control were gone or transformed, let's say, we would have a world of incredible abundance and peace and happiness. Yeah, well, I mean, and, that, and we could have that. We could have that. That's the brave new world that I write about um, in my articles sometimes. But for people to let go, I mean, control has a lot to do with importance. And um, people like to feel important. So the more yes. important a person comes, the more they're special and he, they create observers. It's a particle physics thing that, you know, a, a particle isn't solid until you observe it. And so people move towards control and fame and all of that because... It's a death avoidance mechanism because it allows them to feel more special, more important, more more solid. Um, you know, I am That's the, true, yeah. I'm the ruler here or I'm the manager of the Western region and I'm going to boss everybody about. So uh, specialness is the opposite to godliness. And and in, it's interesting that in government we find, and even in medicine, we find that this, this phenomenon that you just talked about People adorn themselves with symbols of authority. Uh, in the military, it's it's badges. In the government, it's uniforms. In medicine, it's a lab coat. Uh, they adorn themselves with these symbols. And, you know, we even just posted a video about uh, silly marches. And you've got, you know, John Cleese with his famous uh, Department of Silly Walks. Yes, yes. In the UK. And there's all this, this nonsense sort of self-congratulatory behavior in these systems of control to take on the appearance of importance where behind the scenes, philosophically, they actually lack authority. They, they, well, they're empty, so yeah, they have I mean, to fake a, it. A lot of our leaders are sort of emotional, spiritual cripples. And um, then they wouldn't go, I mean, they wouldn't try to become leaders unless there was something terribly wrong with them. Because a spiritual person isn't going to want to lead anything. They're going to want to be with themselves and their friends and evolve and understand themselves. And they're not up for conquering the world or leading anything in particular, you know. And I always say to my people that read my books, you know, be nothing, agree to be nothing, and then you're safe, then you're free. It doesn't mean that you don't have a sense of self-worth or like eternity inside of you. You do. But in the social, political, whatnot world, agree to be nothing. Agree to be last. And then I tell people, agree mm -hmm. to lose. You know, if you're playing a game of chess, make a silly move really early on. Agree to lose. Hmm. What, what, are the, what are the 
names of your books, by the way? Well, I wrote a, quite a well-known book called The Infinite Self, and I wrote one about money called The Trick to Money's Having Some. And I think if people go to Amazon and look for Stuart Wilde, S-T-U-A-R-T, Wilde, they'll, they'll see them there. There's 20 books out there at the moment, and um, I haven't written any more books recently because, I don't know, the whole book thing sort of died a bit, you know, and it's not really what it used to be in the olden days. But, um, yeah. yeah, they're all books about personal liberty and consciousness and how to break free of this control matrix that's all around us that's getting worse and worse. Yeah, well, how, how do you think, where can we find traction as a civilization uh, overcoming the controllers and the deceivers and actually moving into a truly a new golden age of, of awareness and consciousness and, and spiritual vitality? Well, I think sites like your site and sites like my site and so forth are teaching people different things. But I think the main traction is when you link in with people of like mind. And whether that's an ayahuasca group or a church or a meditation group or whatever it might be, you know, people studying permaculture or whatever, I think you have to sort of reach out and find other people that are on the same wavelength. Otherwise, you can be conned into thinking that the whole world is this sort of fascist nightmare, you know, that's all around you, which it is, but it's good to know that there's yeah. other souls out there that are in, in the same, they're with you, you know, and they're with us and we're joined. Yeah. We're a massive group around the world, albeit diffused, but we're massive. I mean, we're hundreds of millions of people that are on this sure. consciousness parabola away from fascism and government control and all that nonsense. Well, that's, that's, that's a really powerful truth because in, in, in truth, the controllers are a very small percentage of the total number of people. It's just that the other, let's say, 99% agree to be controlled. They, they tolerate yeah. The fascism. I Where, think they're you know, pretending. Percent of the people just want to be free. Yeah, I think they're pretending for the most part. They're just too scared to give the police the middle finger. But deep in their soul, the middle finger comes up instantly, doesn't it? You know. <laughs> so you know, yeah, they're true. just self-preservation keeps them from being too overt. But I don't think that a lot of people in the world want to be uh, controlled by some fascist pigs marching down the street. That's not the case, you know. No. No, and, and, you know, there's a small percent who want to join them for the power, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but most people just want to be left alone, which is really where I come from, too. I, I want to be left alone to, to grow some plants here, to, to, to live on my farm, and, and you know, to, to live in it with a sense of safety from the physical society so that I can explore spiritual reality. But... Here, uh, an important thought along those lines is we have to have enough freedom to be able to protect the vessel, the body, which it, that the spirit occupies during this lifetime in order to, to have spiritual growth. So we have to have some basics of liberty and safety and freedom in order to just have the opportunity for spiritual development here. Yes, I think you're right. And whether or not that will be the case, you know, forever and ever, I don't know, because it looks to me like it's getting worse and worse at the moment. Yeah, I would agree. The threat. But, but one theory on that is that there, there is a wave of awareness, and, and we are you know, part of it, and, and, and we are experiencing it, and that the systems of control are becoming so desperate that they're accelerating their timeline to try to seize any remaining control because they see this wave of awareness approaching. What, what do you think about that, Stuart? Well, I've seen this light coming. Um, Trevor Ravenscroft, who wrote The Spear of Destiny, which was sort of a classic about the um, occult nature of the Nazis and stuff, he called it the solar logos. And he said that the return Jesus was inside the solar logos. And I don't think he meant that Jesus would be any one particular person more the Christ consciousness, the golden light of, of Gaia, the golden light of the gods. And I've seen that light. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it, and I've seen how it washes over humanity. It's going to take out the controllers. It's going to take out the fascists. It's going to resolve everything in the end. But I think there's going to be a tug of war between the fascist controllers and the spiritual people sort of creeping off and hiding because... I don't think there's any point in us trying to confront because 
you know, hey, they can bang on your door tomorrow, can't they, if you really, really want to confront. And we started the top of the hour talking about the control that's exercised by these various uh, social networks and internet companies. You know, that's the beginning of what's going to happen all over the world. Mm -hmm. So in the well, end, we right. have to just leave. We have to leave or find a rural community or, or something like that because... I don't know, like I always tell my readers and the people that read my site, StuartWild.com, that like one day I'm not going to be here. Not because I'm dead, but because it won't be allowed. The sort of stuff I write about just won't be allowed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems like, you know, it, it, it's uh, dark times may uh, lay ahead for us, but also on the other side of that, an incredible awakening. You know, humanity's got to, to find a way to go to the next quantum leap uh, we're, we're stuck right now we're stuck in you know just exploiting the planet uh, polluting the planet poisoning ourselves and each other and calling it profit you know making children sick and then making money off of treating their sickness and then people have retirement funds they're invested in the drug companies so they think they're getting ahead while their child is dying from preventable cancer you know yeah. this spiral of self-destruction it's it's an illness <laughs> and it's a cancer on the on the on humanity Yes. And it's got to end. Yes, it's tragic. I mean, it has to end. And then my old teacher said that when the fascists came, you know, would come, and he sort of predicted it 40 years ago, he said there'll be more and more and more light. And he talked about the Tao, you know, the, the ebb and flow of nature, the eternal Tao. And he said the Tao would come, the beings would come, Gaia would come, awareness would come um, to compensate for the fact there was more dark. And I think anybody that's in this sort of spiritual thing like yourself, uh, Mike, knows that the light is, is bigger now. People's awareness is massive compared to it, the way it used to be. And so in many ways, the yeah. dark's done us a favor because the more these sort of snivelers attack, the better we all do. Do you follow me? Yeah, I, I, I do see that. And I, and I, I recognize that eternal, uh, you know, in Chinese medicine, yin and yang. Yeah, um, yeah. Power. That, that is always there, and yeah, the worse the darkness gets, the more, the, the stronger the, the, the light will become to compensate. Yeah. It's true. And of course, the spiritual people and the sort of light bearers and that sort of stuff, they're not there, you know, they're not in the news, they're not on TV, they're not, you know, they're more silent and humble, and, but they do create a change. I mean, I think that when you walk down the street, your light will fry a 100,000 ghouls. It can change the evolution of people that if you stop and talk to them or even if, let's say, you touch them because you shook hands with them and stuff, their light's going out in ways that we do not completely understand or that we only yeah. partially understand. And it, and it is making a difference. It's, it's definitely, uh, the world is evolving, but it's evolving sort of quietly and underneath while all the news is on top. I mean, all the clutter in the news and the programming and the regulations and the executive orders and all that nonsense is on, it's, that's in the news. But the spiritual stuff's like this golden river that's flowing, and it's going to essentially, in the end, transform the world. I, I, I agree, and it's, it's like the, the controllers are fighting the previous war. They're, they're, they're fighting for control of the press or control of the dollars. They're fighting in a realm that has already been transcended, I think, in the minds of many. They're going to lose the spiritual war because they're still fighting a physical war or an economic war. That, at least that's my assessment. Yeah, definitely, because I don't think in the spiritual war, war they have the knowledge or the jargon or the, the comprehension. And so they can't really appeal to people spiritually. And then they can terrorize them with you know, money and taxes and you know, all the different stuff. You know? But, I mean, yeah. in the end, truth is truth, and people know. People know, you know, they know about the bankers and the Illuminati and they know about Israel and they know about the wars and the chemicals and the pollution and the fluoride in the water. Like, I mean, it's amazing to me how much people know. They know a lot. It's mostly because of the internet. Yeah. And sites like yourself and so forth, naturalnews.com. I mean, there you are every day. There's a hundred different things people can read about the GMO debate and so forth, you know. So I think yeah. humans are very well informed compared to the way um, they used to be. Well, that's that's a good point, and that's very young too. You know, the internet really only took off in the early 
1990s. Yeah. And most people weren't online until the late 1990s. I mean, we're, we're only talking about roughly 15 years of people being privy to alternative information. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very, that's, that's a very short time. Uh, considering that that uh, information was completely monopolized before Exactly. That. I mean, on my site, we translate a certain selection of my articles into Russian. Well, imagine during the communist era, how would I have got through to any Russians? Do you follow me? But today, yeah, right. I don't know how many Russians click my site every day, but some do. And um, it's like, there we are. It's almost like a beachhead has been established in Russia now. And... Um, it's it's just it's just all over the world in all the different languages and all the different uh, uh, it, well it's it's such a massive massive information isn't it about health and living and consciousness and awareness and meditation and DMT and ayahuasca and spiritual groups and I mean it's it's everywhere it's absolutely everywhere. Yes, and, the, and this is why the internet is being routinely attacked, yes. uh, blamed for things. Um, the you know the newspapers are losing circulation in a huge way. Yeah. Uh, print magazines are shut down. Like yeah. I think Newsweek was one of them. Yes. Used to be a print magazine. Now it's no longer. Time magazine is probably headed in the same direction. The New York Times, you know, used to be the, the newspaper of record. Now Gerald Salente calls it the toilet paper of record. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, things are changing, and and, and hence the, the need for Facebook to censor people who will cite history because yes. they just yes. can't stand for uh, free information to flow across Facebook without intervention. Well, it's just the forces of control and the forces of specialness. And, but in the end, we win, <laughs> even though yeah, it doesn't look yeah. like we're winning. You know, it looks like we're getting beaten up on. But no, I mean, truth wins and the light wins and um, all the sort of fascist controllers, I mean, they fall because the light swamps over the top of them. Well, that's it. That's it. They, they destroy themselves. Yeah. And, you know, spiritually, that they, they do. And, and all we really have to do, I mean, at a spiritual level, I guess, is you know, stay in our vibration of, of knowledge and awareness and, and ultimately love and, and those destroyers will destroy themselves exactly so Although I, that's probably hard to follow in a practical sense you know i I, well, I i can't stay silent you know about these things but spiritually it's like we really don't have to do that much except no focus on love focus on love and focus on perpetually my old teacher called it skimming the lake and that's the process of perpetually looking at yourself and seeing how well you did and whether you could have done better and what dark and devious thoughts are coming up inside of you and stuff like that. And so if we attempt to stay clean, you know, sometimes we fast for a few days and it's just the attempt to stay in the energy and in the light all of the time. Well, yeah, and I, I, I agree with that. And I think also it's that, it's that self-awareness, that self-coaching of your own decisions and your own behavior. So... You know, there are some in organized religion who think that you can, you can go out and, and destroy all week and be a sinner all week, but as long as you repent on Sunday, you're spiritually cleared. Yeah. And I don't follow that. I, I think that you are accountable for everything that you consciously do, and so we must, we must be, uh, we, we must proceed with compassion and care and a sense of responsibility about our own lives, but also how we impact everything else around us. I think that's, you know, at the end of, of the life, I think we are judged on the whole of what we have done. Definitely. This, that's definitely the case. I mean, in the ayahuasca worlds that we talked about earlier, um, everything is a feeling. So it doesn't matter what a klutz you are, as long as you have a sweet feeling. If you have a sort of an innocuous feeling or a feeling of goodness and warmth towards humanity and the animals, or you could be the most brilliant scientist, but if you're evil in your thinking or controlling, then, then you will see the hell worlds. But essentially, the celestial worlds respond to warmth and uh, tenderness, uh, respect, just those particular qualities that are not particularly hard to, to generate inside oneself. They just, you have to be disciplined about, you know, remembering to be respectful, remembering to be tender and warm and kind to people and so forth. Yeah, and and to animals, 
levels, uh, I, I would say, mm. and, and, you know, the earth, the ecosystems. Yeah. I mean, I don't campaign for vegetarianism, but I don't know any people that aren't vegetarians. And all the people that have sort of made massive strides in their awareness, all the ones that I know are vegetarians, because I think it's hard if you eat meat. But also nowadays, meat is so polluted. I mean, it's green. There's, what is it, pig slime. And in England, they put horse <laughs> meat in the burgers. And, you know, in China, they eat dogs. And I mean, it's all like, hello, I think eating meat is really dangerous. I ran a story on my site a couple of weeks ago about how the FDA knows there's arsenic in chicken. You know, so you go for your chicken yep. McNuggets and have a nice little sort of morsel of arsenic. Well, you probably don't get enough arsenic in your chicken McNuggets to die, but even so, you don't really want to be eating arsenic. And so I think when people realize yeah. that, hey, chicken's got arsenic in it, beef's got hormones in it, and so forth and so on, you know, they're just going to move away from meat and eat less of it or none of it. Well, that's, that's absolutely true, and I, I, I've written a lot in, in this realm I'm not a vegetarian myself, although I have been I have been a, a vegan too in the past. But I I only eat meat very sparingly, and only when I I know the farmer and I know the environment and I know the experience of of the animal. And even yeah. then, it's very limited. But yeah. for me, it's more like um, I don't want to eat factory farmed beef because of the experience of the cow yeah. living in a factory farm. I mean, that's that's hell. Yeah. That's torture. Yeah. Uh, day after day, you know, for as long as they're kept alive, barely. Um, and, and where I live in Texas, I, there are cows nearby that I see that are free range. Yeah. And this is the best time of their lives. After they free range here, they get sold off to the feedlots and then they go into hell. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a sad and sorry tale, but uh, humans have to become more aware and more conscious I think here, Mike, we'll come out, we'll close it out here because we're coming up to about an hour. And so that'll oh make, it, that'll make, <laughs> Time got away from us. yeah, that'll make a nice little segment. So look, let me just ask you, um, we're coming up to the top of the hour here, Mike. Is there anything you'd like to say before we close out? I just want to thank you for the invitation to have this discussion. And, and, you know, at a, at a soul level, it's, it's affirming to know that that people like you exist and that we can have these kinds of discussions and that I'm not alone in thinking that, uh, you know, there's more than just the physical world. <laughs> and, and I've, again, I've never used DMT, but, um, I was able to come to these conclusions through another way, yes. through another pathway. Yes. It's a universal truth. It's a universal truth. And if any time you want to come to the ayahuasca, just let us know and we'll comp you. You might have to pay the, the hotel fee, but you won't have to pay for the ceremony or to go to the gig. But the hotel fee is like nothing. It's like maybe 50 bucks a night or something, you know. And we would be more than happy to co copy to come to Ecuador or to come to Holland or whatever you are like over this way. Obviously, in America, we can't offer you the, the ayahuasca experience no. because it's illegal there. Well, I'd much rather visit Holland. I've never been to Holland, but I've, I've met many people from there who are just wonderful, brilliant, uh, creative people, and just nice folks, too. <laughs> really, yeah, really it's, polite it's, society, actually. It's a lovely place, Holland. It's fantastic. So you'll enjoy it there if you go there for four or five days or whatever. You know, you'll love it. Sounds like it. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation. And, uh, again, I enjoyed talking with you, Stuart. Yeah, thank you very much for talking with me. It's been good fun. And uh, I'll just remind people, naturalnews.com. Mike Adam, and there you go. A wonderful site, full of good information. I go on almost every single day to that site and look through the articles and see what's happening, and uh, I recommend it highly to my listeners. Okay, thank you very much. Well, well thanks, Stuart. All right, thank you, Stuart. Yeah, bye-bye now. Bye-bye. And um, it's like, there we are. It's almost like a beachhead has been established in Russia now, and... Um, it's it's just it's just all over the world in all the different languages and all the different uh, uh, it, well it's it's such a massive massive information isn't it about health and living and consciousness and awareness and meditation and DMT and ayahuasca and spiritual groups and I mean it's it's everywhere it's absolutely everywhere. Yes, and the, and this is why the internet is being routinely attacked, yes. uh, blamed for things. Um, the you know the newspapers are losing circulation in a huge way. Yeah. Uh, print magazines have shut down. Like yeah. I think Newsweek was one of them. Yes. 
used to be a print magazine. Now it's no longer. Time magazine is probably headed in the same direction. The New York Times, you know, it used to be the, the newspaper of record. Now Gerald Salente calls it the toilet paper of record. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, things are changing, and, and, and hence the, the need for Facebook to censor people who will cite history because yes, they just yes. can't stand for uh, free information to flow across Facebook without intervention. Well, it's just the forces of control and the forces of specialness. And, but in the end, we win, <laughs> even though yeah, it doesn't look yeah. like we're winning. You know, it looks like we're getting beaten up on. But no, I mean, truth wins and the light wins. And um, all the sort of fascist controllers, I mean, they fall because the light swamps over the top of them. Well, that's it. That's it. They, they destroy themselves. Yeah. And, you know, spiritually, that they, they do. And, and all we really have to do, I mean, at a spiritual level, I guess, is you know, stay in our vibration of, of knowledge and awareness and, and ultimately love. And, and those destroyers will destroy themselves. Exactly. So I, that's probably hard to follow in a practical sense. You know, I, I, well, I, I can't stay silent, you know, about these things. But spiritually, it's like we really don't have to do that much except no. focus on love. Focus on love and focus on perpetually. My old teacher called it skimming the lake. And that's the process of perpetually looking at yourself and seeing how well you did and whether you could have done better and what dark and devious thoughts are coming up inside of you and stuff like that. And so if we attempt to stay clean, you know, sometimes we fast for a few days and it's just the attempt to stay in the energy and in the light all of the time. Well, yeah, and I, I, I agree with that. And I think also it's that, it's that self-awareness or that self-coaching of your own decisions and your own behavior. So, you know, there are some in organized religion who think that you can, you can go out and, and destroy. What about, what about after this life? Is, is there, for those who have, really engaged in a lot of destruction and evil and deception do 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 they do they literally experience a, a timeless purgatory hell type of uh, uh, existence then i don't know if it's timeless but they definitely um, experience yes a purgatory hell but then their higher self can incarnate back on this earth plane even though they may still be in hell so the right. the, the higher self has various incarnations in it so there are people on earth that have like a higher self that last time they were on earth uh, was was a mass murderer, you know. So that's how yeah. evil is propagated because there's nothing stopping the higher self reincarnating again into the earth plane, even though that individual person may be stuck. Because the times are so vast, it's impossible to say that they're there forever or not. We're not old enough and we never will be to figure it out ourselves. Do you follow me? Yeah, but from what I've read in, in uh, near-death experiences, um, that the dimension of time is gone in, yeah. in hell. So it's, it's like they've been there an instant, but also an eternity. Well, it's, um, yeah, it's that, a perpetual now. Yeah, you get that feeling of it being a perpetual now. But how long it is in relation to, let's say, Earth years, we can't tell. That's interesting, a perpetual now. Right, yeah. that's, that's, that's consistent with what I've read. Yeah, it's, that's what it is a day. It's a perpetual, a perpetual now. There's no sense of time. But then a lot of those dimensions don't have horizons either. So they're very confusing because you don't know if you're upside down or inside out or left or right. You can't, you can't discriminate because there's no flat line to look at. You know, and even if uh -huh. you're sitting in a room, there's a flat line on the other wall that shows you that you're up straight. But some of those dimensions, there's no up straight. You cannot tell if you're upside down or straight or left or right or upside down or inside out. You can't tell. It's very, it's very confusing. So how, how is it that you were able to uh, witness this, this hell? I mean, uh, you know, what, what was that? Were you an observer flying through or, or experiencing it yourself momentarily? Or what, how did that? Work? I saw it first on ayahuasca. And I saw these uh, cactus thorns on my hands. I held my hands up and I saw the cactus thorns. And I asked, what are they for? And I heard point and shoot. And so I'd see a ghoul in the distance and I would just breathe like a short, sharp breath at it. I would expel a breath and I would see this, this yellow dot go out and hit it. And then after that, I found that I could just see it in trance because by then I was used to it. 
So I'd sit on my bed and I'd fight and I'm four to six, sometimes eight hours a day, just down there watching them. And when I saw them, I'd fire, fire at them. But they were attractive. Oh, what, what were you seeing? What? Well, you see these demonic... Well, yeah, and I, I, I agree with that. And I think also it's that, it's that self-awareness, or that self-coaching of your own decisions and your own behavior. So, you know, there are some in organized religion who think that you can, you can go out and, and destroy all week and be a sinner all week, but as long as you repent on Sunday, you're spiritually cleared. Yeah. And I don't follow that. I... I think that you are accountable for everything that you consciously do, and so we must, we must be, uh, we, we must proceed with compassion and care and a sense of responsibility about our own lives, but also how we impact everything else around us. I think that's, you know, at the end of, of the life, I think we are judged on the whole of what we have done. Definitely, this, that's definitely the case. I mean, in the ayahuasca worlds that we talked about earlier, um, everything is a feeling. So it doesn't matter what a klutz you are, as long as you have a sweet feeling. If you have a sort of an innocuous feeling or a feeling of goodness and warmth towards humanity and the animals. Or you can be the most brilliant scientist, but if you're evil in your thinking or controlling, then, then you will see the hell worlds. But essentially, the celestial worlds respond to warmth and uh, tenderness, uh, respect, just those particular qualities that are not particularly hard to to generate inside oneself. They just, you have to be disciplined about, you know, remembering to be respectful, remembering to be tender and warm and kind to people and so forth. Yeah. And and to animals, uh, I, I would say, yeah. and, and, you know, the earth, the ecosystems. Yeah. I mean, I don't campaign for vegetarianism, but I don't know any people that aren't vegetarians. And all the people that have sort of made massive strides in their awareness all the ones that I know are vegetarians because I think it's hard if you eat meat. But also nowadays, meat is so polluted. I mean, it's green. There's, what is it, pig slime. And in England, they put horse <laughs> meat in the burgers. And, you know, in China, they eat dogs. And I mean, it's all like, hello, I think eating meat is really dangerous. I ran a story on my site a couple of weeks ago about how the FDA knows there's arsenic in chicken. You know, so you go for your yeah. chicken McNuggets and have a nice little sort of morsel of arsenic. Well, you probably don't get enough arsenic in your chicken McNuggets to die, but even so, you don't really want to be eating arsenic. And so I think when people realize yeah. that, hey, chicken's got arsenic in it, beef's got hormones in it, and so forth and so on, you know, they're just going to move away from meat and eat less of it or none of it. Well, that's, that's absolutely true, and I, I, I've written a lot in, in this realm. I'm not a vegetarian myself, although I have been, I have been a, a vegan too in the past, but... I, I only eat meat very sparingly and only when I, I know the farmer and I know the environment and I know the experience of, of the animal. And even yeah. then, it's very limited. The head force, but also on the other side of that, an incredible awakening. You know, humanity's got to, to find a way to go to the next quantum leap. Uh, we're, we're stuck right now. We're stuck in, you know, just exploiting the planet, uh, polluting the planet, poisoning ourselves and each other and calling it profit, you know, making children sick and then making money off of treating their sickness. And then people have retirement funds that are invested in the drug companies, so they think they're getting ahead while their child is dying from preventable cancer. You know, yeah. this spiral of self-destruction, it's, it's an illness, <laughs> and it's a cancer on, the, on, the, on humanity, yes. and it's got to end. Yes, it's tragic. I mean, it has to end. And then my old teacher said that when the fascists came, you know, would come, and he sort of predicted it 40 years ago, he said there will be more and more and more light and he talked about the Tao, you know, the, the ebb and flow of nature, the eternal Tao. And he said the Tao would come, the beings would come, Gaia would come, awareness would come um, to compensate for the fact there was more dark. And I think anybody that's in this sort of spiritual thing like yourself, uh, Mike, knows that the light is, is bigger now. People's awareness is massive compared to it, the way it used to be. And so in many ways, the yeah. dark's done us a favor because the more these sort of snivelers attack, the better we all do. Do you follow me? Yeah, I, I, I do see that, and I and I, I recognize that eternal, uh, you know, in Chinese medicine, yin and yang. Yeah. Um, yeah. Power that that is always there, and yeah, the worse the darkness gets, the more the, the stronger the, the the light will become to compensate. Yeah. It's true. And of course, the spiritual people and the sort of light bearers and that sort of stuff. 
they're not there. You know, they're not in the news, they're not on TV, they're not, you know, they're more silent and humble. And, but they do create a change. I mean, I think that when you walk down the street, your lie will fry a 100,000 ghouls. It can change the evolution of people that if you stop and talk to them or even if, let's say, you touch them because you shook hands with them and stuff, their light's going out in ways that we do not completely understand or that we only yeah. partially understand. And it, and it is making a difference. It's, it's definitely, uh, the world is evolving, but it's evolving sort of quietly and underneath while all the news is on top. I mean, all the clutter in the news and the programming and the regulations and the executive orders and all that nonsense is on, it's, that's in the news, but the spiritual stuff's like this golden river that's flowing and it's going to essentially in the end transform the world. I, I, I agree. And it's, it's like the, the controllers are fighting the previous war. They're, they're, they're fighting for control of the press or control of the dollars. They're fighting in a realm that has already been transcended, I think, in the minds of many. They're going to lose the spiritual war because they're still fighting. Use uh, DMT in the ayahuasca ceremonies um, as a way of sort of filling people's supply back up. And it also explains why sometimes when a person has an ayahuasca journey, the first journey they have, they just go into a bliss state and they can feel what they what is known in South America as the medicine, la medicina, which is going around their body, but they don't see visions. And then on the second journey, they see visions. So it's almost like the glass has to be filled up first before they can see. But I mean, it's known as the spirit molecule because of its visionary gift to right. humanity. And I think the, the bigger, I, I agree with everything you just said, by the way, but I think the, the real story here is that globally, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I believe there is a global effort to suppress consciousness. And that effort takes many forms. Some of it is chemical, such as in the fluoride that's put into the water supply. Uh, some of it is is uh, energetic or informational, such as the, the suppression of knowledge that's done by government regulators to try to make entire civilizations forget about their ethno-botanical history, uh, the wisdom of the plants. You know, the FDA's role in the United States is to obliterate all indigenous knowledge uh, plant medicine. There, there are many other examples of this, but governments do not want people to attain consciousness. And this is the main reason behind the war on drugs. The war on drugs doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make sense from a justice point of view or a judicial point of view. It only makes sense if you realize the government wants to keep people suppressed and unaware and spiritually devolved or even thinking that they don't have a spirit. So that's that's why DMT might be the key to unlocking a revolution of spiritual freedom for the future of humanity. That's the big story. Well, I think that's right. And I think that there has been this suppression because obviously the more people that take, let's say, DMT or mushrooms or that smoke pot, the more they get out of the matrix, they get out of TikTok. Now, mushrooms were legal in Britain just up until a couple, three years ago. And I mean, you really? could just walk into any shop and buy them, but they banned them and then they banned them in Holland. And there were a few right. horror stories of teenagers getting stoned and jumping off bridges into the canal and that sort of stuff. But <laughs> there wasn't really any reason to ban them. But yeah, there is this global dumbing down of society. And then I've noticed also the, the censorship that goes on. I mean, you're not really free to write what you want to write anymore on the Internet no. without being sort of stomped upon. And certainly all the big sites, you know, YouTube. The vessel, the body, which that the spirit occupies during this lifetime in order to, to have spiritual growth. So we have to have some basics of liberty and safety and freedom in order to just have the opportunity for spiritual development here. Yes, I think you're right. And whether or not that will be the case you know, forever and ever, I don't know, because it looks to me like it's getting worse and worse at the moment. Yeah, I would agree. The threat. But but one theory on that is that there, there is a wave of awareness, and, and we are you know part of it, and, and, and we are experiencing it, and that the systems of control are becoming so desperate that they're accelerating their timeline to try to seize any remaining control 
because they see this wave of awareness approaching. What, what do you think about that, Stuart? Well, I've seen this light coming. Um, Trevor Ravenscroft, who wrote The Spear of Destiny, which was sort of a classic about the um, occult nature of the Nazis and stuff, he called it the solar logos. And he said that the return Jesus was inside the solar logos. And I don't think he meant that Jesus would be any one particular person more the Christ consciousness, the golden light of, of Gaia, the golden light of the gods. And I've seen that light. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen it. And I've seen how it washes over humanity. It's going to take out the controllers. It's going to take out the fascists. It's going to resolve everything in the end. But I think there's going to be a tug of war between the fascist controllers and the spiritual people sort of creeping off and hiding because... I don't think there's any point in us trying to confront because, you know, hey, they can bang on your door tomorrow, can't they, if you really, really want to confront. And we start at the top of the hour talking about the control that's exercised by these various uh, social networks and internet companies. You know, that's the beginning of what's going to happen all over the world. Mm -hmm. So in the well, end, we right. have to just leave. We have to leave or find a rural community, or, or something like that, because I don't know, like I always tell my readers, and the people that read my site, stuartwild.com, that like one day I'm not going to be here, not because I'm dead, but because it won't be allowed, the sort of stuff I write about just won't be allowed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it seems like, you know, it, it's, it's uh, dark times may uh, lay ahead for us, but also on the other side of that, an incredible awakening. You know, humanity's got to to find a way to go to the next quantum leap. Uh, we're we're stuck right now. We're stuck in, you know, just exploiting the planet, uh, polluting the planet, poisoning ourselves and each other, and calling it profit. You know, making children sick, and then making money off of treating their sickness, and then people have these various uh, social networks and internet companies. You know, that's the beginning of what's going to happen all over the world. Mm -hmm. So in the well, end, we right. have to just leave. We have to leave or find a rural community or, or something like that because I don't know. Like I always tell my readers and the people that read my site, stuartwild.com, that like one day I'm not going to be here. Not because I'm dead, but because it won't be allowed. The sort of stuff I write about just won't be allowed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It seems like, you know, it, it's, it's uh, dark times may uh, lay ahead for us, but also on the other side of that, an incredible awakening. You know, humanity's got to to find a way to go to the next quantum leap. Uh, we're, we're stuck right now. We're stuck in, you know, just exploiting the planet, uh, polluting the planet, poisoning ourselves and each other and calling it profit, you know, making children sick and then making money off of treating their sickness. And then people have retirement funds that are invested in the drug companies, so they think they're getting ahead while their child is dying from preventable cancer you know yeah. this spiral of self-destruction it's it's an illness <laughs> and it's a cancer on the on the on the humanity yes. and it's got to end yes it's tragic i mean it has to end and then my old teacher said that when the fascists came you know would come and he sort of predicted it 40 years ago he said there will be more and more and more light and he talked about the Tao, you know the the ebb and flow of nature the eternal Tao. and he said the Tao would come the beings would come Gaia would come, awareness would come um, to compensate for the fact there was more dark. And I think anybody that's in this sort of spiritual thing like yourself, uh, Mike, knows that the light is, is bigger now. People's awareness is massive compared to it, the way it used to be. And so in many ways, the yeah. dark's done us a favor because the more these sort of snivelers attack, the better we all do. Do you follow me? Yeah, I, I, I do see that. And I, and I, I recognize that eternal... Uh, you know, in Chinese medicine, yin and yang. Yeah, um, yeah. Power that, that is always there. And yeah, the worse the darkness gets, the more, the, the stronger the, the, the light will become to compensate. Yeah. It's true. And of course, the spiritual people and the sort of light bearers and that sort of stuff, they're not there. You know, they're not in the news. They're not on TV. They're not, you know, they're more silent and humble. And, but they do create a change. I mean, I think that when you walk down the street, your light will fry a hundred thousand ghouls. 
It can change the evolution of people that if you stop and talk to them or even if, let's say, you touch them because you shook hands with them and stuff, their light's going out in ways that we do not completely understand or that we only yeah. partially understand. And it, and it is making a difference. It's, it's definitely, uh, the world is evolving. But it, in Holland, where it's legal, and in um, Ecuador, and our site is uh, thehiddendoorway.com, and um, they're very safe because they're sort of not run by like shonky shamans. You know, these are sort of very <laughs> upstanding. Well, some of the shamans are, are very dodgy. And then there are other shamans sure. that are, are absolutely wise old men. They're beautiful and, and they bring a great thing to ayahuasca. But then there's the ones that sort of want to rip off the gringos that are out there as well. But... Um, our people are British and, um, you know, they're sort of terribly upstanding. So that's how we offer the ayahuasca ceremonies in safe environments where it is legal. And I think it's semi-legal in Portugal because Portugal got rid of almost all of their drug laws. Um, it's quite an extraordinary piece of legislation. But, um, and of course, drug crime in Portugal has, Portugal has completely collapsed. There is no drug crime there anymore because everything there is legal. And so... Um, it's made a huge difference. No, I think it's a brilliant it's, solution. Well, it is a solution because, you know, if they sort of made, I mean, if there were sort of hash shops, pot shops that you could go to and maybe even pay a government tax to get an ounce or whatever and other, you know, fairly benign drugs, then then you wouldn't need all the violence and the guns and all that stuff, would you, you know? It, well, that's it. Once you, you know, prohibition doesn't work. Socially, economically, um, it, it, just in terms of laws, it doesn't work. No matter what you're trying to prohibit, you know, we had that terrible experiment in America in the 1920s with uh, alcohol prohibition. Uh, it didn't work. It failed. And what, but what it did do was it funneled millions of dollars, which at that time was like billions, into the underground criminal economy. It created a criminal economy yes. and it created a, a, a brutal police state <clears throat> government whose job was to run around throwing people in prison who were just trying to have a beer, you know? So whether you prohibit DMT or marijuana or uh, alcohol, it, it always has the same economic effect, which is this huge underground economy, massive criminality, violence, you name it, is, is what is spawned from that policy. So prohibition doesn't work ever throughout, throughout world history. It hasn't worked, it doesn't no. Work. No. I noticed reading on your site, naturalnews.com, there's lots and lots of stories of alternative red remedies for cancer and, and stories about pesticides and Parkinson's disease, I think I read this morning. And there's a sort of movement now to sort of get rid of vitamins, to get rid of alternative therapies, to sort of make all those people seem like they're sort of witch doctors and it and life and maybe there's things they have to experience down the road that you just don't want to change necessarily so they'll come when they want to and they won't if they don't want to and that's simple really yeah that's i i tend to agree with that you know live and let live i have sort of a libertarian philosophy uh, along those lines yes and uh, but of course, so much of the world that exists today is all based on controlling you. It's not live and let live. It's, it's you know, we, the government, want to control, you know, what you think, what you eat, even, even how you experience consciousness. <laughs> I say, so, I say know, in my book that um, control is demonic because it's like demonic yeah. possession and that administration is different because the example I give is if you own or if you run a, a railway company, Administration is, you know, setting a tie table, you know, hiring drivers, getting the railway. Right. You know, that's different because the drivers can come to work or not as they wish. But, uh, you know, forcing control over people is, is a demonic trait. It's part of how the hell worlds want to dominate us. So we should try to stay away from control and allow everybody to be what they want to be, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And... Uh, there are just so many systems of control that, that are resisting that. But think about where our world could be if we really allowed, if everyone had an allowing philosophy and it was more about how do we support others rather than dominating them. Um, 
I mean, I'm sure you're well aware that most of the wars and terrorism and everything is all fabricated. You know, it's all yeah. staged and engineered to create control. Um, if if those systems of control were gone or transformed, let's say, we would have a world of incredible abundance and peace and happiness. Yeah, well, I mean, and, that, and we could have that. We could have that. That's the brave new world that I write about um, in my articles sometimes. But for people to let go, I mean, control has a lot to do with importance. And um, people like to feel important. So the more yes. important a person comes, the more they're special and he, they create observers. It's a particle physics thing that, you know, a, a, a particle isn't solid until you observe it. And so people move towards control and fame and all of that because it's a death avoidance mechanism because it allows them to feel more special, more important, more more solid. Um, you know, I am That's the, true, yeah. I'm the ruler here or I'm the manager of the Western region and I'm going to boss everybody about. So uh, specialness is the opposite to godliness. And, and in, it's interesting that in government we find, and even in medicine, we find that this, this phenomena that you just talked about, people that adore self, although I have been, I have been a, a vegan too in the past, but I, I only eat meat very sparingly and only when I, I know the farmer and I know the environment and I know the experience of, of the animal. And even yeah. then it's very limited. But yeah. for me, it's more like um, I don't want to eat factory farmed beef because of the experience of the cow yeah. living in a factory farm. I mean, that's, that's hell. Yeah. That's torture. Yeah. Uh, day after day, you know, for as long as they're kept alive, barely. Um, and, and where I live in Texas, I, there are cows nearby that I see that are free range. Yeah. And this is the best time of their lives. After they free range here, they get sold off to the feedlots and then they go into hell. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a sad and sorry tale, but uh, humans have to become more aware and more conscious I think here, Mike, we'll come out. We'll close it out here because we're coming up to about an hour, and so that'll oh make it, that'll make. <laughs> Time got away from us. Yeah, that'll make a nice little segment. So, look, let me just ask you: um, We're coming up to the top of the hour here, Mike. Is there anything you'd like to say before we close out? I just want to thank you for the invitation to have this discussion, and, and you know, at a, at a soul level, it's it's affirming to know that that people like you exist and that we can have these kinds of discussions and that I'm not alone in thinking that, uh, you know, there's more than just the physical world. <laughs> and, and I've, again, I've never used DMT, but, um, I was able to come to these conclusions through another way, yes. through another pathway. Yes. It's a universal truth. It's a universal truth. And if any time you want to come to the ayahuasca, just let us know and we'll comp you. You might have to pay the, the hotel fee, but you won't have to pay for the Sobe or to go to the gig. But the hotel fee is like nothing. It's like maybe 50 bucks a night or something, you know. And we would be more than happy to co comp you to come to Ecuador or to come to Holland or whatever you are like over this way. Obviously, in America, we can't offer you the, the ayahuasca experience no. because it's illegal there. Well, I'd much rather visit Holland. I've never been to Holland, but I've, I've met many people from there who are just wonderful, brilliant, uh, creative people, and just nice folks, too. <laughs> really, yeah, really it's, polite it's, society, actually. It's a lovely place, Holland. It's fantastic. So you'll enjoy it there if you go there for four or five days or whatever. You know, you'll love it. Sounds like it. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation. And, uh, again, I enjoyed talking with you, Stuart. Yeah, thank you very much for talking with me. It's been good fun. And uh, I'll just remind people, naturalnews.com. Mike Adam, and there you go. A wonderful site, full of good information. I go on almost every single day to that site and look through the articles and see what's happening, and uh, I recommend it highly to my listeners. Do it. And therefore, we have to be your daddy and your mommy and tell you what you can buy and what you can't buy and what you can drink. Well, but they conveniently ignore that every year, just in America alone, 783,000 people are killed by medicine, killed by pharmaceuticals, killed by surgeries, killed by superbug infections in the hospitals. That number alone is 48,000 annually. This is annually. So, you're looking at 700 something thousand annually, are you, Mike? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 783,000 yeah. per wow. year killed yeah. by conventional medicine. Not on purpose, obviously. They're not being murdered. 
but they're being killed by conventional medicine. So this idea that, oh, we got to ban uh, DMT because, you know, five people might might overdose on it. Meanwhile, you, you're, you know, a thousand times more likely to get killed by a superbug infection down at the local clinic. You know, it just doesn't make sense. It, it's hypocrisy. Well, the fact is that, like, um, you know, ayahuasca has been going for 100,000 years. And um, there aren't really any reports of anybody dying from taking ayahuasca. Right. And then there was a story that I read some months ago about a kid. He was a teenager, and the shaman gave him a bottle of ayahuasca to look after. And the kid decided to drink the whole bottle. And, <laughs> yeah, but that was like, you know, taking, I don't know, it'd be like, let's say, drinking 25 bottles of whiskey or something, you know. And uh, right. he did meet a sorry end, but I don't think anybody within a controlled ceremony with a proper shaman has ever died on ayahuasca because DMT is natural. It's not like on mushrooms, people can space out and drop off a bridge, you know, or jump over. Yeah. But um, it's... Uh, well, well, right. So... But they don't want people experimenting. That's the thing. See, in society today, it's, it's all about conformity. Look at public schools. It, 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 when you when you're a child, at least in America, this is the way it works. You go to public school, they don't tell you, "Oh, be creative, be innovative, be independent, be no. uh, uh, explore on your own, discover the world, uh, you know, express your greatest your greatest self." No, the message is: stand in line, don't talk, raise your hand, obey, 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 conform, obedience, obedience. You're not allowed to have. Thoughts outside the box. Yeah. You're not allowed to explore outside the box. Here's your history. Here's yeah. the allowable science that you're supposed to learn and repeat. Here's the allowable uh, uh, words and phrases that you can use in English class. I mean, George Carlin, who was a brilliant comedian, yes. was very right about this when he said, all they want to do is create obedient workers. That's the goal. And DMT wakes people up, at least this is my understanding, it wakes people up and it causes them to challenge the obedience grid. Chemicals and the pollution and the fluoride in the water. Like, I mean, it's amazing to me how much people know. They know a lot. It's mostly because of the internet. Yeah. And sites like yourself and so forth, naturalnews.com. I mean, there you are every day. There's a hundred different things people can read about the GMO debate and so forth, you know. So I think yeah. humans are very well informed compared to the way... Um, they used to be. Well, that's that's a good point, and that's very young too. And you know, the internet really only took off in the early 1990s. Yeah. And most people weren't online until the late 1990s. I mean, we're we're only talking about roughly 15 years of people being privy to alternative information. Yeah. <laughs> that's a very that's that's a very short time. Uh, considering that, that uh, information was completely monopolized before Exactly. That. I mean, on my side, we translate a certain selection of my articles into Russian. Well, imagine during the communist era, how would I have got through to any Russians? Do you follow me? But today, yeah, right. I don't know how many Russians click my site every day, but some do. And um, it's like, there we are. It's almost like a beachhead has been established in Russia now. And... Um, it's it's just it's just all over the world in all the different languages and all the different uh, uh, it, well it's it's such a massive massive information isn't it about health and living and consciousness and awareness and meditation and DMT and ayahuasca and spiritual groups and I mean it's it's everywhere it's absolutely everywhere. Yes, and the, and this is why the internet is being routinely attacked, yes. uh, blamed for things. Um, the you know the newspapers are losing circulation in a huge way. Yeah. Uh, print magazines have shut down. Like yeah. I think Newsweek was one of them. Yes. Used to be a print magazine. Now it's no longer. Time magazine is probably headed in the same direction. The New York Times, you know, it used to be the, the newspaper of record. Now Gerald Salente calls it the toilet paper of record. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, things are changing, and 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 hence the the need for Facebook to censor people who will cite history because yes. they just yes. can't stand for uh, free information to flow across Facebook without intervention. Well, it's just the forces of control and the forces of specialness. And, but in the end, we win, <laughs> even though yeah, it doesn't look yeah. like we're winning. You know, it looks like we're getting beaten up on. But 
No, I mean, truth wins and the light wins and um, all the sort of fascist controllers, I mean, they fall because the light swamps over the top of them. Well, that's it. That's it. They, they destroy themselves. Yeah. And, you know, spiritually, they, they do. And, and all we really have to do I mean, at a spirit. talked about the Tao, you know, the, the ebb and flow of nature, the eternal Tao. And he said the Tao would come, the beings would come, Gaia would come, awareness would come um, to compensate for the fact there was more dark. And I think anybody that's in this sort of spiritual thing like yourself, uh, Mike, knows that the light is, is bigger now. People's awareness is massive compared to it, the way it used to be. And so in many ways, the yeah. dark's done us a favor because the more these sort of snivelers attack, the better we all do. Do you follow me? Yeah, I, I, I do see that, and I and I, I recognize that eternal, uh, you know, in Chinese medicine, yin and yang. Yeah. Um, yeah. Power that that is always there, and yeah, the worse the darkness gets, the more the, the stronger the, the the light will become to compensate. Yeah. It's true. And of course, the spiritual people and the sort of light bearers and that sort of stuff, they're not there. You know, they're not in the news, they're not on TV, they're not, you know, they're more silent and humble, and, but they do create a change. I mean, I think that when you walk down the street, your light will fry a 100,000 ghouls. It can change the evolution of people that if you stop and talk to them or even if, let's say, you touch them because you shook hands with them and stuff, their light's going out in ways that we do not completely understand or that we only yeah. partially understand, and it, and it is making a difference. It's, it's definitely, uh, the world is evolving, but it's evolving sort of quietly and underneath while all the news is on top. I mean, all the clutter in the news and the programming and the regulations and the executive orders and all that nonsense, is on. It's, that's in the news. But the spiritual stuff's like this golden river that's flowing, and it's going to essentially, in the end, transform the world. I, I, I agree, and it's it's like the, the controllers are fighting the previous war. They're 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 fighting for control of the press or control of the dollars. They're fighting in a realm that has already been transcended. I think in the minds of many, they're going to lose the spiritual war because they're still fighting a physical war or an economic war. That, at least that's my assessment. Yeah, definitely, because I don't think in the spiritual war. war they have the knowledge or the jargon or the, the comprehension. And so they can't really appeal to people spiritually. And then they can terrorize them with, you know, money and taxes and, you know, all the different stuff, you know. But, I mean, yeah. in the end, truth is truth. And people know, people know, you know, they know about the bankers and the Illuminati and they know about Israel and they know about the wars and the chemicals and the pollution and the fluoride in the water. Like, I mean, it's amazing to me how much people know. They know a lot. It's mostly because of the internet. Yeah. And sites like yourself and so forth, naturalnews.com. I mean, there you are. Every day there's a hundred... ...be if we really allowed, if everyone had an allowing philosophy and it was more about how do we support others rather than dominating them, um... I mean, I'm sure you're well aware that most of the wars and terrorism and everything is all fabricated. You know, it's all yeah. staged and engineered to create control. Um, if if those systems of control were gone or transformed, let's say, we would have a world of incredible abundance and peace and happiness. Yeah, well, I mean, and, that, and we could have that. We could have that. That's the brave new world that I write about um, in my articles sometimes. But for people to let go, I mean, control has a lot to do with importance. And um, people like to feel important. So the more yes. important a person comes, the more they're special and he, they create observers. It's a particle physics thing that, you know, a, a, a particle isn't solid until you observe it. And so people move towards control and fame and all of that because... It's a death avoidance mechanism because it allows them to feel more special, more important, more more solid. Um, you know, I am That's the, true, yeah. I'm the ruler here or I'm the manager of the Western region and I'm going to boss everybody about. So uh, specialness is the opposite to godliness. And and in, it's interesting that in government we find, and even in medicine, we find that this this phenomena that you just talked about People adorn themselves with symbols of authority, 
uh, in the military, it's, it's badges. In the government, it's uniforms. In medicine, it's a lab coat. Uh, they adorn themselves with these symbols. And, you know, we even just posted a video about uh, silly marches. And you've got, you know, John Cleese with his famous uh, Department of Silly Walks yes, yes. in the U.K., and there's all this this nonsense sort of self-congratulatory behavior in these systems of control to take on the appearance of importance where behind the scenes, philosophically, they actually lack authority. They, they, well, they're empty, so yeah, they have I mean, to fake a, it. A lot of our leaders are sort of emotional, spiritual cripples. And um, then they wouldn't go, I mean, they wouldn't try to become leaders unless there was something terribly wrong with them. Because a <laughs> spiritual like person isn't going to want to lead anything. They're going to want to be with themselves and their friends and evolve and understand themselves. And they're not up for conquering the world or leading anything in particular, you know. And I would say to my people that read my books, you know, be nothing. Agree to be nothing. And then you're safe. Then you're free. It doesn't mean that you don't have a sense of self-worth or like eternity inside of you. You do. But in the social, political, whatnot world, agree to be nothing. Agree to be lost.